Hello everyone, Shadowrock here with another day, another Card and Shield trailer straight out of nowhere. Tonight, Integrates hits us with a new story trailer, which gives us a ton more details on the plot, as well as revealing new mechanics for the gameplay. And after that, we have some updates for you on Divine Dynamo Flamethrift as well. Which was supposed to be one of the fictional games featured in Card and Shield, but now it's a real game. Anyway, let's get right into it. The new story trailer for Card and Shield starts off with a recap of what we know so far. Onsi, a developer on the game Rust Tactics, gets into contact with Neon, the gaming chair detective, in order to help her investigate the powerful data running rampant inside the virtual world, which are known as Mad Obstructive Data, or MODs for short. Neon accepts the case and promises to help Ansi fix the Rust Tactics world, and so begins the quest of investigating the various mod dungeons, which as we know, features both fictional and real Integrates games. In fact, over the last couple months, Integrates has been releasing a bunch of new clips and trailers that feature the games that are going to be in Card and Shield, both fictional and also things like Luminous Avenger X, Gal Gun, and so on. I've been asked a couple of times why we haven't seen Blaster Master Zero yet, and to be honest, that's because that's a Sunsoft IP. Maybe BMZ can still make it in at some point, but it would probably be DLC as kind of a collaborative event. The same likely goes for Mighty Number no. 9. They would have to get Inafune's permission for that. Anyway, the trailers for each of the different game series feature some of the cards that are within those specific sets, the muses that you can use, a little bit of the story segments for those particular stages, and a little bit more. So if you want more specific information, definitely take a look at those. Getting back to the main story now, this next part of the trailer, I believe, happens a bit further into the game, maybe halfway or something. So if you don't want any mid-game spoilers, I would recommend skipping to the timecode above so you can get right to the gameplay reveals. Alright, you ready? Let's go. So early on at least, our heroes are going to find these error fragments from each of the dungeons that they clear. But suddenly, a mysterious man calling himself Sullivan and Noct appears to steal the error fragments. This is going to be our main rival character throughout the game, and boy oh boy does he look straight out of a gunvolt game. After Nanak sucks up the error fragments of his mysterious power, he uses them immediately to open up a security hole, a dimensional rift that creates a mod dungeon, wait for it, in the real world. Oh no. So now the stakes are higher because now we've gone outside of the fictional game world. Now this malicious data is affecting the real world too. Honestly, pretty cliche for a plot such as this because the more I learn about this plot, the more it's reminding me of Digimon Story Cyber Sleuth and well, a lot of animes in general that have this sort of cyber world plot. Mega Man NT Warrior can count too. Anyway, once this mod dungeon appears in the real world, Neon and Ansi are quick to log out and rush to investigate, running into each other in the process, and this is where we get the reveal of their real life outfits. Nice to know that Neon still keeps the Yu-Gi-Oh protagonist hair even in the real world. Oh yeah, speaking of reveals, I think this is the first time we have some of the English voice actors revealed. And among them, the one that stands out to me the most is that Ansi is voiced by Christina V. You know, Shantae. Other than that, listening to the trailer, the voice acting does seem competent overall. So that's a good sign. Since, you know, it is an anti-creates game, we're going to spend a lot of time listening to people talk, so it's good that so far to my ears, everyone is doing a good job. Also, shoutouts to the Asimov guy who brought out his Asimov boy seemingly just for this trailer. He's back. Oh shoot, we ourselves should be getting back to the story. So we see Neon and Ansi enter the real world dungeon, where they come face to face of Nanak himself. Nanak goes on with the usual Inti creates villain spiel about how he wants to reshape the world as he sees fit, and to achieve that goal, he's going to use the error fragments. Furthermore, he appears to know a lot more about the mod phenomena than anyone else does at this point in the game. Then, Nanak summons his quote, beloved muse, 
Rita. She is a powerful mod whose song has the power to interfere with reality itself. And you can see her Muse card has the ability to prevent performances from beginning and nullify all current effects. So I guess that means no muses for you. Furthermore, the official description says that Rita has no will of her own and moves slowly on Nanak's command. What a terrible fate. After all that, we skip around through a few scenes here where Ansi appears to get sucked into a big old black hole that Nanak summons. The trailer then skips to the scene where Neon appears to save her, with some tugs at the heartstrings here and there. But otherwise, that's pretty much it for the story details for now. We got the reveal for the big bad, we've raised the stakes a lot, and apparently Antichrist is really hoping that this main plot will incentivize you to finish the game, as even though this is a roguelite, failing a dungeon doesn't mean you start back at the very beginning. Instead, the game is going to allow you to start from the dungeon that you failed on so that you can tackle it again with a new strategy and see if you succeed. And that appears to be the gist of how the story progression is going to go. NT is really hoping that the main plot for this game is going to help Card and Shield stand out amongst the roguelite deck building genre as they call it. Such as the other Bound Network lookalikes, I guess. Lastly, they do have a new main theme song that they're revealing today titled To the Promised Sky and sung by Ansi's Japanese voice actors. They have a whole music video that I will put a link to in the description below so you can listen for yourself. To my ears, it's pretty dang nice. Alrighty, we are officially out of the spoiler territory and we're gonna get right into the gameplay mechanic reveals. The first major mechanic we're going to talk about today is known as Area Subjugation. So if you clear out all the enemies in any given room in a dungeon, you will get a choice of three different rewards. Recovery, Enhance, or Position. Recovery is self-explanatory, it's going to restore your HP. There is perhaps a couple of other ways to restore your HP during a dungeon, but Inti says that this is the most reliable way to do it. Position allows you to choose a card from your deck or a muse that you have required and position them in the dungeon room. When you position a card this way, you will be granted bonuses when battling in nearby rooms adjacent to the one that you placed the card in. When you use a muse for the position feature, they will perform their song at the very beginning of battle in the nearby rooms, so you get their passive bonus and special skill energy right from the start. So I imagine if you use this strategically, you will have a better chance of steamrolling the rest of the enemies in the other rooms. Keep in mind, however, that the position feature will temporarily remove the card from your deck. However, you will get the card back when you move on to the next floor. Last but not least is Enhance. With this feature, you can apply a cheat code to one of three random cards in your deck. Cheat codes provide powerful additional effects to that card and also every copy of that card in your deck. The effects include additional damage, reducing the playing cost, or buff simply by drawing the card. And you are allowed to stack up to three cheat codes on the same card. This honestly reminds me a lot of the star cards in the Mega Man Star Force series, but a bit more complex. It looks like the enhance and position features in particular are going to shake up a little bit of how you tackle each dungeon. In true roguelite fashion. Next up, we're gonna learn about the rewards you get for clearing dungeons, as well as how scoring works. So based on how you clear the dungeon, you're gonna get experience points for Neon, unlock new difficulty levels, and progress the main story, of course. Now your score at the end of the dungeon is determined by how many turns you took in battle. So you are incentivized to clear the dungeon as fast as possible in the least amount of turns possible, but there's a catch. Because you start with an entirely new deck when you start a dungeon, you're going to be pretty weak at first. So you are going to have to do at least some battles in order to get better cards and upgrade yourself a bit. As a result, you're going to have to play a balancing act. You need to get more powerful cards so you can win battles faster, but you also want to skip as many battles as you can in order to get the top score. It looks like it's going to come down to figuring out how to get the best cards as fast as you can, 
and then running to the goal. When you clear a dungeon, you will unlock new difficulty levels depending on how high your score was. If you get a high enough score, you can get up to 3 new difficulty levels unlocked at once. And like we talked about in the previous coverage of this game, higher difficulties will not only increase enemy stats, but they also add new rules to the gameplay, just to shake things up even more. I believe last time we also saw these decode tokens mentioned. Well, now we know what they do. Decode tokens are used to power up Neon. You can spend the decode tokens to improve the odds on every dungeon you tackle, improve your drop rates, cheat codes, HP, and more stats. The decode tokens are given to you as clear bonuses for taking on the different difficulties for each dungeon, so yeah. You are incentivized to take on the harder difficulties so you can get more power-ups. And yeah, that's pretty much it for the gameplay reveal so far. It's nice to know that there's more mechanics underneath the hood that will make things a little bit more interesting. I know a lot of people still have criticisms about how slow the gameplay looks in action in each of the trailers and I wholeheartedly agree with you guys. But as always, I'm going to hold out judgment for when I have the game in my hands and am able to review it for myself because it may always be that kind of thing where the gameplay looks boring from the trailer but when you actually get down to playing it, it gets a little bit more interesting. But hey, I mean, we'll see how it goes. I am glad at least that there is going to be an overarching main plot to this game because from the onset, it looked like it was just going to be, okay, we're going to have a bunch of crossovers with other NT properties and these fictional game worlds as well. I'm just gonna have a big old fun crossover game. That's gonna be it. But nope, there's gonna be a lot more going on than that from the looks of it. And we're gonna get another very sad and depressing NT story, I'm sure. The question is, who's gonna die this time? What did you guys think of the reveals for Card and Shield today? Let us know in the comments. As we move on to a word about Divine Dynamo Flame Frit. It really does look like for a while there, Inti Crates had no idea what they wanted to do with this game. At first, they tried to play it off as a April Fool's joke. They even told members of the press, such as myself, that yeah, it's gonna be a real game, but go along with the joke anyways, pretty please. That was kind of weird. And then, yeah, they later revealed that it is going to be a real game. However, it's going to be exclusive to the Japanese physical copies of Card and Shield in Japan. With no word on an official English release or anything like that. I complained about that too because, man, that sucks. Like, okay, some NT Crates fans import their games from Japan anyway since that's where a lot of the special editions go. But from a preservation standpoint, it just sucks that it was going to be just an addition to Card and Shield only in Japan. Thankfully, I don't know if it's because they listened or something else, but NTS changed their minds and decided to make Divine Dynamo Flame Frit a full-on standalone release. So here we go, the third time in a row they have announced quote-unquote this game. Let's hope the third time's the charm. Now, I gotta say, based on the new debut trailer, this game actually looks really dang cool, not gonna lie, like, I like what I'm seeing here. Whereas Nintendo is currently taking 2D Zelda into a different direction by actually making it a Zelda game, go figure. Integrates over here is making their own version of 2D Zelda, and for me, it definitely looks to scratch that itch. The gameplay looks very Zelda-like, the graphics are beautiful, the only bad thing I could say about it is, yeah, the voice clips from the main character Yuto here is, oh boy, it's gonna get old pretty fast. Not because the acting is bad or anything, it's just a repetition of clips, you know what I mean. Many of these types of games suffer from this issue. And of course, as we've seen a couple of times now, when you get into a boss fight, you pilot your good old robo-buddy Flame Frit which is actually voiced by Peter Von Gom, who in the Mega Man universe is known for voicing Gray from Mega Man ZX Advent, and of course, X and Flame Hyenard in Mega Man X7. Okay, whatever you say. Still, it's pretty neat that he's still active in the industry to this day. Anyways, that's pretty much most of the details on Flame Frit so far. 
The game looks really cool so far, and if you agree with me, well, I got news for you. It's coming winter 2024 on Nintendo Switch, PS4, PS5, Xbox Series, and Steam. Hopefully it gets a standalone physical release too. With that, we're done for today. I would like to thank all of you so much for watching. Be sure to stay tuned to Shadowbox DX for more things on anti-crates and Mega Man in general, which does include the big July 2024 roundup that is going to be worked on next. Also as a quick announcement, I am going to be doing a lot more live streams from now on, and part of that initiative includes releasing stream schedules every week. So definitely stay tuned to the community tab on the Shadowbox DX YouTube channel so you can see the stream schedule for the upcoming week. Such as this week, we've been playing Rockman EXE Phantom of Network. It's been a lot of fun. We're getting towards the end of that game. And I'm going to be continuing the Die Randomizer as part of the Randomizer Marathon later this week. From there, the plan is to release a new stream schedule every Sunday so you guys know ahead of time what I'm doing at what time. Generally, it's just going to be the mornings before I go to work at 11 a.m. through 1 p.m. So pretty short streams, but should be a lot of fun anyways. Hope you guys can make it. With that, I would also like to thank all of our channel supporters here on YouTube, including UH class supporters LML123, Carl Nasar, and Rico Syndrome. Thank you guys so much. Welp, and until the next one, rock on and have yourselves a great time then.